Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you our keynote speaker. Born in Griffin, Georgia, Wyoming Atias went to Tennessee State University on a track scholarship where she was coached by the legendary Ed Temple. Then she went on to the 1964 Olympics where she won gold in the 100 meter sprint, tying Wilma Rudolph's world record. In 1968, she set a new world record and became the first person ever to win back-to-back -back Olympic gold medals in the 100-meter sprint. Carl Lewis matched this accomplishment 20 years later, but Wyoming Atias did it first. She won gold in the 4x100-meter relay as well. Miss Tias expressed quiet protest by wearing black shorts in the 1968 Olympics rather than the standard issue white uniform shorts. Her protest didn't get as much press attention as her peers John Carlos and Tommy Smith, but it was nonetheless brave and heroic. John Carlos and Tommy Smith held black gloved fists above their head on the medal stand and wore no shoes with black socks to symbolize black poverty and the need for equal rights. Oh, yeah. Olympic champion and champion for women's rights and human rights, Miss Tias is a world-class athlete, a wife, a mother, an author, a mentor, a three-time gold medalist, and namesake of our beloved Tias Park. She's kind, compassionate, generous. And did I mention she's from Griffin? Please give a loud Griffin welcome to Miss Wyomia Tyus. Ms. Tice, thank you so much on behalf of all of us for flying all the way out from L.A. and, and giving your time to us. Just a minute ago, she had a phone call from, was it NBC? NBC. NBC, and she said, I I'm sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Priorities. <laughs> so, ironically, the Olympics are going on right now in Tokyo. The last time they were in Tokyo, Earned, Ms. Tias earned two medals the last time they were in Tokyo in 1968. Uh, 64. 64. I stand corrected. Um, and another little bit of irony, uh, a gentleman named Daniel who has attended this church since he was four is on Team USA right now over there competing in the 110 meter hurdles. So ironic, he's there, she's here in his church. Pretty cool. We make great champions here, you see. We do. We do. Not only in athletics, but all over. Here in America and here in Spalding County. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to have a little Q&A session and allow her to share some of her life experience, some of her wisdom. There's a lot of it. So we'll try to squeeze as, as much into this little time that we have together. Uh, and I'll, I'll just bounce some questions off of you. And if you'll just share with us, it would, uh, it would certainly bless us all, I'm certain. Um, so tell us about being the first back-to-back -back champion in one of the most high-profile events in the Olympic Games? Well, I don't, where do you start? First of all, let me say thanks to everyone that is here, and thanks for coming out, and thanks for the great job you do with young people, and that's very appreciative. I was one time when those young people were needed encouragement, and I just want to say thanks a lot. Uh, Winning back to back was not something I was really looking at. I was just knowing that Mr. Temple, who's a coach for me at Tennessee State University, uh, going to Tokyo, and when I won in Tokyo, he says, well, Tyus, you know you got 68. So I'm like, 
Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't really have an opportunity to enjoy that 64 experience totally because I was still thinking, I have four more years, I gotta try and do this again. And, uh, and along the way, there were a lot of obstacles. I mean, uh, from just trying to graduate from college and, and just growing up as a human being. I found out in 1964, when we went to Tokyo, I did a lot of growing up, which helped me a lot. So just winning back to back was something that by my senior year in, high, in college, I decided, okay, I think I can do this. And uh, my goals were to go to Mexico City and be the first person ever to, in 100 meters in track and field to win back-to-back -back goals. And I did accomplish my goals, and uh, that lets everybody know we all can accomplish our goals. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and I'll just add, for perspective, uh, since the first modern Olympic Games, it took 72 years for someone to do that, and that someone was, was Miss Tice. So a great accomplishment. Only four or five people have done that ever? Well, there's been two, uh, three women, and which nobody really talks about, but there are three women. Uh, Gail Devers, who lives right here in Atlanta now, uh, she won, and then we have uh, Shelly Ann Price, who won from Jamaica, and then we have for us, the men, they came much later. <laughs> but, <laughs> We're a little slower sometimes. <laughs> Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis. Who and, won, and Usain and, Bolt. And Usain Bolt is in his own category because he's won three back to back. Well, <laughs> we know who did first, don't we? <laughs> so we love to talk about your accomplishments because we're proud of you and proud with you. Um, but there's so much more uh, to Miss Tyus than just her accomplishments and, and, and the accolades she's earned. Tell us where you started, and if you don't mind, share some of the greatest lessons you learned in walking around the farm with your father. Well, I grew up right here in Griffin, Georgia. Well, I grew up on a dairy farm, which is right outside of Griffin. It's, um, well, if you know where, I'm sure a lot of you might know, but where Rose's store is there. I grew up in that area right there. It used to be a big dairy farm, and uh, I grew up with three older brothers, and we grew up in a neighborhood where we were the only black family that was living there, and all our friends and things were white kids that we played with all the time. So I, there were no girls to play, well, there were girls to play with, but we weren't allowed to play with white girls. We, were, we could play with the white boys, but not the girls. So I played with boys the whole time growing up, and I played every sport they played. If, if they wanted to make a sport in riding a bicycle the fastest, of course I had to win, I wanted to say. But my dad was always the person that told my brothers, and you know, it doesn't matter that she's a girl, you let her play. Because at the time I was growing up, girls, they had certain roles they wanted girls to take on, that you had to do girls, you learn to cook, you learn to do this, you learn to do, but to be out there playing sports and being good at what you do, you were never encouraged to do that. So I, my dad was always encouraging me and, and, and telling my brothers, she can do it because she's better than both of you, of all the, <laughs> he was right. But <laughs> so I learned at a very early age to uh, stand up for myself and, uh, as what I say now, I learned to stay in the fight, no matter what fight it is. If it's she learned to win the fight. <laughs> it, yeah, she's being modest. I'm going to reference this a few times because everybody in this room should get on Amazon and buy it. But this is where I learned a lot and, and, and learned what questions to ask. But from what I read, uh, you won every fight and, and you weren't afraid of them. Well, I, I like to think I did, and, uh, I, and I don't know if my brothers would say that, but, <laughs> but I, I did. I mean, I stood in there, I hung in there, and that's, that's the key. And, I, uh, and my dad was such a big supporter, and when you, if you think about that, it was not something that men did for their daughters. They, could, they encouraged them to do a lot of things, but to be in sports and be good at it, and, and also and make their siblings, we were brothers, 
make, let your sister be a part of the activity. And, though, and that was something that was unheard of when I look back at it. But at the time, it was just common things. And, and my dad, we would go walking because his farm we lived on was so big, we would walk every weekend, my brother and my dad and I, and doing the walks, there were so many things. He was just talking, not so much trying to teach us, but just telling us the general things about what's going on in nature and why, because I was one of those kids, well, why is that? How do you know that? What makes that right? You know, I was one of those type kids, and he would say, well, you just pay attention to what's on around, on around, going on around you. You look at what's going on around you, observe it, you know, we're all, you can be afraid of certain things, but if you get to know it, you know, you have to understand things. So like one thing I was afraid of was snakes. And I didn't, and it was like, cause my mom was so afraid of them. And she would think, you know, growing up, they would always say, they're gonna eat you. And you know, like, how can they eat us? How do they eat you with that small mouth? And they, you know, but no, you know, the one with giving me those answers and I went on to be a naturalist and and I the same things that I was afraid of and one of the th biggest things I found that young people are afraid of especially when it comes to nature and outdoors is snakes because they believe a snake is going to swallow them and I tell them their mouths are this big they can open it about four times that big and they're not going to be able to swallow you your head's too big <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that leads me to another question. In some of our preparatory conversations, uh, Ms. Tice and I agree that people are afraid of what they don't know. Yes. Uh, and so if we expose them to new places, new cultures, new animals, new, new ideas, then they're, yeah. they're, they're less likely to be afraid of them. And one of the things that she did in, in, uh, in her life experience, she served at a camp outside of L.A. Uh, where you taught kids through experience, you expanded their world by exposing them to things, snakes being one of them. Um, what, what can you tell us a little bit about that life experience and about your being a mentor, you know, for kids at that camp? Well, I worked, I mean, I, after I graduated from college and I moved to California and I live in Los Angeles, California, I have, have had several, several, several different kinds of jobs. And, and those are the kinds of things you have to do to make, I mean, at that time, it's not like the, you, know, you think of an Olympic champion and winning three gold medals, how they, you know, pretty much they can write their own ticket now. It was not like that when I was competing. So and you had to get the education and uh, you had to, you know, go and have that eight to five, you know, every day. And I got a job uh, working in outdoor education with LA Unified School District. And what it was, we taught the, all the natural sciences, and uh, students would come to camp for a week, and it would be 40 students, two different schools. They bring uh, uh, 10, uh, 20 girls, 20 boys, and uh, we try to teach them the experience of being outdoors and learning about nature and how we, as humans, have to be more nicer, kinder, and gentle to the nature. And for me, when I think about being at camp and the students get off the bus the first day and you get them in your group, it was anywhere from 18, 18 to 20 kids in your group, and you have to uh, talk to them, you have to bring them together to try to make them understand, hey, we are a team. How are we going to do this? We can't do it if one person, we can't hike if one person decides that. Well, I want to run on the trail. Well, you can't do that because you can easily fall off. So we had to pull them together and let them know that, hey, we all have to work together to make this happen. And one thing I would do with my students was that we had a museum and we had snakes that they could hold and all of that. I would say to them, I, would try, I said, who wants to hold a snake? Oh, no, they could eat us. Oh, no, they would bite us. No, this one won't. This is a pet. I don't, they're slimy. They're these things. And I, you know, and I said, well, we're just going to sit in a group and you just, I will hold the snake and I will come by and I want you to just touch the snake. And then you can let me know if it's slimy. And their touching was always, I said, well, that way they will bite you because you're poking them. You're not touching them. Because <laughs> you're hitting them. They don't like that. So 
once you get, and then it's like, oh, and then once they start to touch the snake, I said, well, they have scales, and you need to rub them the way their scales go backwards. Don't rub this way, because you could pop up a scale. It's going to hurt them. And then they would like, oh, and they would like, it's not slimy. No, it's scaly. It's not slimy. And those little things like that, it made them change. It made, I mean, by the end of the week, you could see such a big change. Half of them was like, as soon as I get home, I'm going to get my parents to get me a snake. I said, like, oh, no. <laughs> I, and just the fact that they allowed themselves to experience that. Because a lot of times people, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Can I not be in this? But, you know, a lot of times we, we are put in uncomfortable situations and uh, I think with education and what we do and what you guys do as educators, what we have to do is really have our students and have people to look a little bit further, experience something they may, maybe never experienced before. Simple as being holding a snake it can make you change because I also would teach use a snake as a as thing is that, hey, we start to prejudge, and prejudging is nothing but, uh, re you know, prejudice when you think about it. You're judging a snake and you have not even had opportunity to experience and know the real things about snakes. And once you learn and once you have the experience, you don't, you don't say you have to love them, but you can learn to appreciate it. I love that story because that just exemplifies. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It, it just exemplifies how education reduces fear, leads to empathy, because it better empowers us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, yes. makes more informed decisions. And that's what our teachers do. Yes. Uh, so tell me about a life experience that you had that, that broadened your scope. Uh, when you went to the Olympic Village uh, in, in Tokyo and in Mexico, and all of a sudden you realized, man, we're we're not all that different. In America, <laughs> these guys eat some strange things. Tell us about your experience with different cultures. Well, when I went to Tokyo in 1964, I was 19 years old. Well, I made the Olympic team, I was 18, and waiting to go to the Olympics. So Olympics were held in October then. And I had a birthday and I turned 19. And just the mere fact, it was a long, long trip. That's all I can remember being on the plane forever. And once we arrived in uh, Tokyo, it was at night. And I can just remember, at, I was at the window like this the whole time. And just in awe of so many lights and how beautiful it was flying into Tokyo. And that was an experience I will never forget. And then we had our to go and live into the uh, Olympic Village was really eye-awakening and educational for me because you got an opportunity to see so many different people from so many different countries, people walking around speaking so many different languages, you, and uh, those that could uh, understood English and knew you were from, spoke English, they would say as much as they could because they wanted to learn from you and all of that, just the mere fact to have that opportunity to see that. And then to go to, in the village, you could go to the different dining halls and try all the different foods. I grew up on a dairy farm. We had, <laughs> you know, we had a pond where we lived. We had, I, I ate fish. We raised our own hogs. So I was pretty much a southern, just straight out eating what southern food was about. And I didn't know very much about anything else. I, that was my first time ever experiencing sushi, which I only taste, I didn't eat it. <laughs> and my coach, uh, Mr. Temple, would always, he was a coach of the women's team in 64, and what he did was he would, we would go to a restaurant and he would say that, oh, and tie us, because he called everybody by their last name, don't, sit, don't embarrass us because we, because I didn't eat very much. And he said, you can't embarrass these people. You got to try their food. And when they brought the fish to the table, they brought the fish and it had its head still on. <laughs> it had like a cherry or something in its mouth. And, and they said, and I'm like, we have to eat this? <laughs> and, and it wasn't, I mean, I did try it. But um, that's about it. <laughs> but just the mere fact to do that and be able to 
be around different people. I think I grew so much. I learned so much about who I was as a person. I got, I, I learned that I have to be more open. I have to look at people and, and, and try and communicate. And you know, being in a village and you got all these different languages, you know, you get tired of just saying hi. Just saying hi, so you try and learn different things. And I think 1960, I know 1964 in Tokyo really was great for me. And I know there's a Daniel Roberts who go, who's a member of this church and all of that. And his first trip, I would love to talk to him to see how he felt about being in Tokyo. It's quite different now because of the pandemic, but still the idea of being in an Olympic village, being in another country and seeing so many people that come in contact and learning about yourself and learning who you are. So you be able, he could, you know, you'll be able to just share this with so many people and they can learn to, yes. Well, you were speaking a different language than many of the people and you were trying to communicate and I think our teachers sometimes feel like they're speaking a different language. <laughs> we have to find a place to connect uh, that's so, true. so you can find a common language. Um, and that's why it, it's so valuable for folks like yourself and, and other mentors that, that we're seeking to, to recruit from our community to connect with kids and share life experience. I, I know many of our students has ne have never been to a big city, have yeah. never flown on an airplane. So that, that all these life experiences just help create that common language where we can connect and, and, and converse. It, it happened because, I mean, I grew up on a dairy farm and my parents could not, my dad, there were a couple of things that happened to me when I was growing, I mean, we could, lived on a dairy farm and my our home burned down there. We didn't own the farm, we, my dad worked the farm but a house in which we lived in, it burned down, and then the next year my father passed away. So I became a person that was really kind of recluse and not saying very much. So the opportunity to go to another country or to even go to a university really helped to change me. And the teachers in my school, well, I went to Annie Shockley Elementary, and I went to Kelsey, and I, went, I graduated from Fairmont High School in 63. And uh, those teachers were teachers that really helped me and tried to help me anyway, especially when I was a younger student. And you know, it was more, I was so active and wanted to be out and doing everything and not really getting my lesson, as my dad said. <laughs> and, uh, well, that, that, that sharing that bit of life experience, that leads me to another question that I would love to, to ask you. We all know part of the human condition is, is navigating adversity, and you, you certainly navigated some. So you know, can you share some of your wisdom about how to deal with hard things and heartache, and what advice do you have about you know, dealing with grief and depression or maybe helping those among us that, that are dealing with that? Well, as I was saying earlier with my fasting, my father, my dad was my heart, it was everything. I didn't know how I was going to cope. I mean, those two things that have them back to back years happen. I mean, even when our house burned down, we were in church and it was revival time and our neighbors came to the church, drove to the church to tell us that we had to come because the house was burned down. And I remember getting there and I must have been maybe eight or nine, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, well, no, I was a little older, I'm sorry. I'm a, a tw anyway, 12 or, 12 or 13. And uh, I'm getting there and I just remember a standing at the roadside and my dad, and I'm looking up at my dad and he is just, I mean, the look in his face, it was like he's lost everything. And my mom was just, couldn't believe what was happening. And that was just devastating to even see my both parents not in control, who has always been controlled and made us feel very comfortable and that we were gonna be okay no matter what. And here it is, they weren't okay and I didn't know how to handle that. And then when my dad died, I truly did not know how to handle that. I became a person of very few words. I mean, people ask me questions, I give the yes and no answers. And uh, it was not, I mean, I was depressed. That's basically what it was. But nobody was dealing with that. Nobody was saying anything. My family could not pay for me to have any kind of, go to see someone and someone to talk to me like that. 
And my, I think my mom gave me about a month and a half or so, and she finally said to me, your dad would not like that. He would not like to see you this way. He, he would like to see you being the person that he, you know, being outside, enjoying life and all of that. You need to get a hold of yourself. But it took a while, and it, and it still didn't happen while I was in high school. It, it didn't happen pretty much until I started going to college and having an experience of college, having an experience of traveling and seeing and having to talk and having to say more words than wanted to. And that's a hard thing. I mean, you, would, you know, we see more athletes now speaking up with it, especially what happened with Osaka and now with uh, Simone Bias and... Uh, you have so many athletes, and people look at athletes, especially if they've won medals or, or they're great athletes, they look at them and think, oh, they're invisible. You mean they're not invisible. They, they can do anything. Invincible, Nothing bothers yeah. them. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Superheroes. Mm -hmm. That's how we look at you. <laughs> but they're not. We're human, and that's it. We, we, you know, you cut me out, bleed, you take time to. And, but uh, it's a lot of pressure, and I think as athletes, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, too. For me, I didn't. I tried not to. I was just trying to be like the days so go about it. And you know, if I win, I win. It's not my day. That's how I would go about it. Because, but the whole fact of not being able to um, get out of that depression mode, it just took. It took college pretty much. It took college and took traveling. I can remember my first time meeting Mr. Temple at well, going to Tennessee State in the summer with uh, a camp and uh, Mr. Temple would come to and scout girls that were running track and bring them up for a track camp every, every year. I got an opportunity to, to go there and my first time going there, Mr. Temple was, met me at the, at the train station uh, with this tall woman and I'm like, and he says, Tyus, this is Rudolph. I said, oh, hi, how you doing? We get in the car and we're driving me to campus and they are talking. And I've said to myself, what have I got myself into? They're talking a little too much. But, <laughs> and then when I get there, there are other women, young girls there, that uh, about 30 of us, and they were talking about Wilma Rudolph, and that's who that was. I didn't even know that was Wilma Rudolph. I didn't know anything about track. I was just doing track because my mom said I had to get out of this. <laughs> I had to do something. My dad would be proud of me. Uh, Good boy. job, mom, right? Yeah. Exactly. Let's, let's talk a little more about Ed Temple. Um, 40 Olympic athletes that he produced through his college program, 23 medalists. Um, many of us serve, teach to make a difference. We acknowledge the importance of leaders and mentors. Can you tell us about Ed Temple, who I'm certain was a mentor to you? Um, what did he teach you and, and how did he impact oh. you? Well, Mr. Temple became more of a father figure and a mentor. He was, because uh, I met him right after my father passed, and that helped. And he had some, the same values, and he, you know, he was a little bit harder on me than my dad would have been. But uh, but he was there for me, and uh, he was not only for me. This man, Mr. Temple, you said some of the things I don't. I, he said some of the things he does. He put 40 girls on an Olympic, on different Olympic teams, yeah. and on those different Olympic teams, they won over 23 medals. Yeah. And out of the 23, 13 of them will go. And it's like, it, this, and he did this. At, this is Tennessee State University in Nashville, and he did this with women, which was unheard of, and it's never been done before, and it still hasn't been done. Uh, you think about the times in which he was doing this in the 50s and the 60s, and he did this with a group of women. And women, we know, we're, we're just starting to come into our own, so to speak, when it comes to sports or anything, or, other, any, or anything. People are just starting to look at this and say, women can do this, there's nothing wrong with this. But uh, this man did that, and he was able to keep all us together. And I always uh, um, admired him and I always think about how can I pass this on? How was he able to get us all on the same page? And all of us rooting for in, not just on the athletic field, but he made it so we had to 
help each other. Because he would always say, if you don't help them, who's going to help them? You know, you've had the experience, you share your experience. And he was able to do that with all these women. And we talk about 40 people on the Olympic team. We're not talking about the people that did not make the Olympic team, but was still on but a part of the group, part of the team. But he managed to do that, and also he managed to, that he had a 98% graduation rate. That means all the women there went. It's pretty amazing. So our educators, just like Mr. Temple, oftentimes have to be counselors, coaches, <laughs> encouragers right. of all sorts, and we're so thankful to have the counselors and the mental health clinicians and all those that can help create these testimonies like Mr. Mr. Temple did. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's a great I mean, story. it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of time put in. I think about, and I used to say, uh, uh, Mr. Temple's wife, her name is Charlie V, before she passed, I used to tease her all the time. I used to say, thanks for letting your husband hang out with fast women, you know, she was <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, and you know, it's just that he had that, I don't know what it was. I mean, his, some of his rules now, I didn't want to go by and I kind of sneaked around them, don't you, you know? <laughs> but, uh, and I was not the only one, but you know, his rule was, it's my way or the highway, you know? <laughs> and he had, to, he would always say, especially when I was young, when I was like 15 and 16 going there in the summers, his whole thing with to us as young girls was like, if you don't do what has been told, how you're on a college campus, and I have told your parents that I will protect you and all those things. So he would always say, if you're not doing what you need to do, I will send you home on a bus, in a bus with a comic book and an apple. And people are always going, a comic book and apple? Yes, you will have something to eat and you will have something to read to keep your education going. <laughs> <laughs> so he was always about making sure we all graduated and we all did our part. And everybody, and his whole, his other thing that I think is really great for teachers and educators is that, you know, we all can contribute. We can all make, you can all contribute something. We're not asking you to set the world on fire. We're just asking you to contribute. Well, that's a great segue. Something to read. Let me do another commercial. <laughs> Tiger Bell, the Wyoming Atai story. We need our students reading this to learn about heroes from our hometown. Uh, and it's also great information about Ed Temple. Tell Let me, me just say, too, yes, about this book. There's also, a, we, when I wrote the book, my co writer and I, we put together a teaching guide. And it's really simple and real easy, but you can always request it from the if you want to use it, but it talks about publisher. Okay, sure. So you can do that. Yeah. Great. Well, so thank you. That's that's wonderful to know. I didn't know that. Um, tell us as we're as we're talking about Ed Temple and, and your your track experience, uh, just just through your track career, what are some of the attributes you gained through athletic competition? Things like discipline. You mentioned the value of his his discipline. Oftentimes, discipline is the most loving thing we can do is create discipline and structure, but. You know, discipline, planning, failure, success. What, just the Cliff's Notes version of well, kind of what you learned through the athletic experience. I think that I learned. I learned to be who I am today through that. I mean, I I learned uh, you know staying in the fight, meaning staying in the fight in whatever it is, education, whatever you 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 believe in and what you're going for. Uh, and with. I, I think with me, when I think of sports, it teaches you a lot of great lessons, and it doesn't have to, you know, and, but you also have to know who you are as a person. You know, I always feel that it has to always come from the heart, and that you have to be a person that, um, you know, if it's something you want to do and things you want to, ch you want to change the world, and you want, and I think that's what you as teachers and educators, that's what we try and do. We try to make everybody's life a little bit easier, especially young people. They have so much, so many things coming at them. It's not like when I was growing up. I mean, I kept think, hoping that I didn't run up on a snake or something like that, or I didn't stomp my toe, or, you know. So, I, but in this day and time, there's so many things out there that young people have to face, and they're not already, they're not ready for it. 
But uh, sports really does, it teaches you life lessons. It teaches you to hang in there. It teaches you to stay in the fight. It teaches you, the other part it teaches you, everybody can't win. That's the key, not everybody every can't win. I mean, that was a big thing, especially with the Olympics. Everybody's not gonna get up on the victory stand and win a medal. But everybody in this room, everybody in this world, especially in the room here, we all have gold medals. The you know, gold medal is to give what you have to the people that you are going to be involved with, the young people you're coming in. We are all, we're on a stage. We all have that gold medal. It could be a silver medal. It could be a bronze medal. But we have that medal heart. We have the opportunity to really help young people and try to get them to love themselves. And that's the key thing. And, I'll, I'll, and for me, it's always been, it's how I feel inside and how I'd like to be treated, and I like to treat people the way I want to be treated, and uh, those kinds of things, and that's something that's very difficult a lot of times, And but we, can, you know, stand in that fight, learning from the, being an athlete, it keeps you that way. Now, we saw you on the screen earlier dancing the tighten up. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to dance for us. Well, like, that's good, because I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> But one of the things that all of your competitors, your, your, the people that were running against you, remarked on was how calm you seemed. How, how did you stay so calm in high pressure situations? I think we would all like to glean a little bit of that from you. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's a, a uh, I don't know how to say I, I did it. it was just, that was part of my personality, number one. And I think a lot of it had to do with, too, when I lost my father and being, I always turned inside and I always, and a thing I do all the time, I mean, when I was writing my book, the co-writer would say, gosh, you talk a lot in your head. So I, think, I would look, I mean, I can remember in the 100 meters in 1964 in Tokyo, my best friend, Edith McGuire, uh, got second to me in 100 meters. And, but she, they had picked her to win the 100 meters, and she was going to be another Wilma Rudolph to win three. And um, I can rem remember being in the finals of the 100, and the gun go goes off, and she's right next to me, and we're running, and I'm running, and I'm like, gosh, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm up front. <laughs> and, then, and I'm like, it's 60 meters, I'm like, where's Edith? Because usually by 60 meters, she's catching me. But I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it out loud, but these things are going on and on in my head. And I kept going, where is she? We get to about 80 meters, and there she is. She's pulling up on me. And I tease my friend, I tease her all the time. I say to her, you know, I heard you coming, and I can smell you coming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went on to win, but I didn't even know I won. She ran up, she ran up to me, you won, Tyus, you won. I was like, I did? Oh, okay. <laughs> you can totally see that conversation on the video, too. It's, it's, it's great. But yes. I love how confident you are and how secure in yourself. You know, you knew who you were, and, and you weren't doing anything to please anybody else. You were just doing your best, yeah. and, and your best was what you were going to give, and, and it was what it was. And I think that's, that's the key to anybody's life. You know, you have, you, you have to be satisfied with what you do and what your best is. And, and everybody's best is not the same. That doesn't mean you're not, you don't deserve the best. That is, you know, it's all, we all different and that's great and that's what makes the world and that's what makes us understand and makes us work a lot harder to understand each other. Amen. I have two final questions and these are the ones that, that I think uh, pertain to these guys. They all do because we all live on planet Earth and this okay. is great, great wisdom. But, so tell me about people from Griffin, Georgia, that encouraged the childhood version of you. Um, <laughs> they helped you see beyond Griffin, helped you dream bigger, helped you believe in yourself. Tell, tell me about those people. Well, our teachers, I can just remember being in elementary school and how the teachers were always uh, making sure that we all, you know, got our lessons, so to speak, and we learned and that, and they made sure that uh, there was somebody that, you know, one thing I remember from childhood, from being in school and childhood and then going off to college and being with Mr. Temple is that, you know, Mr. Temple used to say to us all the time, 
you know, you can't just be with athletes all the time. You have to be with different people so you can have, be well-rounded because you never know where you're going to go. And his, his whole thing was, one day you may have to sit among kings and queens and presidents, so you would need to know how to act and, and you would need to know how, what the proper things to do. And you need to have different friends and not just athletes, mm -hmm. you know, because you need to have people all, all different, everything. Anybody speak different language, whatever, you need to learn to do that. And I feel that the teachers who I had in, in elementary school and throughout school here in Griffith, they all were like that. They always wanted us to be better, always wanted us to do. They had gone to college and they knew what it was about and they said, you can do this, but you know, as a second grader, I was not thinking of college, it was just more, when can we go out for recess? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I was but, kickball. I majored in kickball. Yes. And, and, but then, you know, but they made me realize, too, but, you know, you can go out for recess, but, you know, when you're in here, you have to focus on these things because these things are going to move you up, and these things are going to help you get a better education. These things are going to get you in college. And all that. so they work very hard at doing that. I, I can't say it was just one teacher because, to me, all the teachers – that were in our schools were like that. They all were there to help us, to mentor us, to help to keep us on the straight and narrow and make sure that we work real hard to get what we really want in life. And um, So keep it up, guys. <laughs> yep, keep uh, it up. <laughs> it works. The, the, the teacher that helped me realize there was more to school than kickball was, was Miss Karen Goodman at Beaverbrook, and she helped me use my competitive nature in the classroom. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and for the first time, I wanted to make an A because I wanted to beat everybody. <laughs> and, and that stayed with me from then on. So it, it's really important that we have those local encouragers yes. that tell us we can be maybe more than, than we've thought yeah, about. They can point. see us. They can see more than we can see. They, you have the great minds. You, you've been there. You've done that. You know people have. And you can be able to, what when you talk to students, you, are, you, can, you can just say, hey, I've been this way. I've been down this path. And uh, I'm not saying you, you know, I, you need to listen to a little bit more and try some different things, some th other things that will make you grow and make you say, if you want to leave Griffith or you want to come back to Griffith, you want to teach here and educate other young people, and all these things are what you need to look at. They let you look further into the future instead of stopping right here, but let you look. And that's what all of you have done, I'm sure. And that all of you are doing, and you need, and uh, all I can say, big ups to you. So, last piece, I want you to go ahead. Come on, guys. Thank you. And thank you again. And last, last piece, give these guys a charge, in, encourage them, speak to the importance of teachers, and, and, and you know, what can you tell them to, to give them new fervor and, 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 you know, encourage them to continue the race to change the world one child at a time? Uh, well, first of all, definitely stay in the fight. And I, the other thing is that really make it fun for you and for the students. I think if you do that, it works perfect. You, you, get, you will get so much out of it. The students will get so much out of it. And one thing I, I think about when I was at camp, something we had, what I always tried to do, I tried to look at each student and, and I, the first day that they are there, we get them, I say, at two o'clock in the afternoon and we have to return them back to their counselors uh, the, and for the dinner. So we have them from two to five. And at five o'clock, before five o'clock, I would always tell my students, I would know every one of your names and I would know something about each one of you. And before we go into dinner, I was, before they go in, I would say their name, and I would tell them something I'd learned about them while they were in, within those few, hour, those few hours that we were together. And I think that, to me, was something that I tried to do every, 
every week we get new students, I would always know their name. And now, I mean, the other part is I would play games. So you, that's the other thing, the games, I could do it at camp. I mean, you could do some of the things I would do at camp, but icebreakers, you know, just, and not only for them to get to know me, but to get to know the people that they're gonna be with for a week. And you're gonna have them in your classes for the year. So they need to know something about each other. And that's how I would do it. We would play these games and buy, at the first day that they're there, just uh, before we go to dinner that night, I would always have a paper, I would give a paper, a pencil, and an envelope, and I have to put their name on it, and then I would have them write a goal, I have them write what they expect out of camp, I have them write something they would like to happen once they get back to school. I had different things, depending on my group, and they would write it down, they would seal it, and on Friday, when it's time for them to leave to go back to school, I would give I would give this back to them. I would give the papers to the I would give the envelopes. Never open them. Give it to the teacher. On Friday, I would give it to them. They they can open it, read it. They could share with the group, you know, whatever. Or they don't have to share. But it was always something. I would always try to lead them with something, or encourage them to always try something new. And just because, uh, you know. You have not seen this, and uh, you have not been to camp, and camp, camp is not that spooky, especially if we would go on night hikes, and that was the worst for them, because nobody wants to be out at night, and it was like, because all the things they've heard, and then they have a great experience on a night hike, and they were, can we go every night? No, but, <laughs> but uh, I just say to you that, you know, make it fun. Make it, first of all, make it fun for you, because if it's fun for you, then the students are gonna have a great time, because that's it. And they, and just always throwing something new into the game, you know, because when you have them for, uh, you think about uh, the whole year, so you always have something, you know, some gadget, something, I always say. And, I, and camp taught me a lot about being a teacher, too, is that you have to do a lot of little silly things, and students like that. They may not say they do, but they do. It sounds like you challenged yourself trying to learn everyone's name by a certain deadline, and, and, and I know our teachers stretch themselves, challenge themselves, and in doing so, you lead by example and give them something to, yes. to, to follow. So our theme for this school year is pace, and I, I can't think of anyone better to represent setting the pace as we all aspire to set the pace than a three-time gold medalist. Our piece stands for be professional, be accountable, and communicate effectively. Uh, we, at the, at the administrative retreat, we had a pace car from Atlanta Motor Speedway, but I got a feeling she might could give that pace car a run for its money. Um, not now, but maybe. maybe. I, I'm not convinced. I, I think you still got it. Um, I want to give you something on, on behalf of our school system. This is something new that we're beginning to do. Just like you were the first back-to-back -back champion, you're the first one of these. You're the oh. first exceptional alumni of the Griffin Spalding County School System. And you were <laughs> Fairmont High School. Mr. Simmons, would you come up for a photo? We'll, we'll get a photo of the two of you guys. Let me get you to spin that thing around. We'll show off your hardware there. Right. <laughs> but yeah, this so is a real gold medal here. <laughs> it it may not gold be medal. real gold, but I hope it signifies that to us, you, you're worth far more than gold. Oh. And, and we're just so thankful you're our first ever exceptional alumni. This is something we'll continue to do. But Fairmont High School, class of 63, am That's I right? It. That's right. All right, one more round of applause, guys. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good luck through the school year. And, uh, Continue to be good like you are already, all right? And better, all right? Thank you.